the violin, please. Here we go. And action. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, and I used to think so too. I'm Matthew Paris, and like you, I'd always thought seeing was believing. Until, that is, I began working in television. And I discovered what uneasy bedfellows truth and television make. Over the next half hour, and again next Sunday, I'll be placing that relationship, truth and TV, under the searchlight. Oh, it's not bloody good. Look, David, it's no good. We can't go on like this. Oh, God, no. I've got to do it. Please. Oh, I don't tell you, but I want to... A scene from a real-life documentary, Driving School. Maureen Reese wakes up her husband in the small hours to get him to test her on the highway code. Viewers thought it was real. It wasn't. It was staged. The revelation caused quite a storm. Now, before we sail into that storm, a word about direction. This is not another programme about a fake documentary on Colombian drug smuggling, not a shock horror expose of out-and-out -out forgery. It's not my contention that some television is for real, but some is sham. All factual television is sham. Everybody cheats. Just like in newspaper journalism. So before TV producers whine about glass houses, don't think I'm taking sides with Fleet Street. But the television professional's standard response when one of their number is caught out, as over the fake drugs documentary, The Connection, oh, that was just a rogue producer, simply won't do. The problem with truth on TV is TV itself. Not one rotten apple, but the whole damn barrel. Across a whole range of programmes, there's a culture of artifice and mendacity. Necessarily, we believe what we see at our peril. Oh, it's only a paper moon Hanging over a cardboard sea But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me Oh, it's only a canvas sky I know what this is, actually. Have you got the picture on it? No. No, because this is some cutaways. Damon Rose is a TV director. He's here in a BBC editing suite putting the final touches to a seven-and-a-half-minute item, a true story about a disabled man who's met his girlfriend over the internet. It went out on BBC Two a few weeks ago. With a videotape editor, he spent two days mixing pictures, music and sound together, with occasional interruptions from Anton, Damon's guide dog. For Damon Rose is blind. Television isn't a very spontaneous medium, and for me, this is extremely useful um, as, as a blind person who directs television. Um, the vast majority of the work is done in your head. It's done on the computer, on the word processor, back in the office. You write it out, you structure it, you script it. When he leaves the office to shoot a film, he takes an assistant who describes the shots offered by the cameraman. Discussion with both helps Damon grasp what the film will look like. You've talked to your interviewees so many times on the telephones. You know the good little sound bites that they've got. And you want to bring that out on film. You ask the relevant questions. And uh, if they don't say what you want to say, <laughs> you make them say it. <laughs> Damon's not quite handing the cast of his films a script, but very nearly. It's a standard procedure. Little happens for the first time on television. I got news for you, Britain's most popular comedy quiz programme. Aren't the guests clever? And with Paul Merton tonight is a Daily Telegraph journalist who last year took a month off to spend some time on his own. He stood as a Conservative candidate in Wales, <laughs> Boris Johnson. Idiotic guy, I hadn't really seen how I got news for you for ages. And I, I had a vague memory of it as being a quiz programme about the week's news. And so I had spent, you know, about an hour a day boning up solidly on newspaper stories, and my head was stuffed. So let's plough on with flooding is caused by what? Lots of water. Water. <laughs> rain, rain, abundant rain. Um, Actually, I, I do know the answer to this because it was in um, the papers. It's... <laughs> you pitch up fairly early in the afternoon and you're closeted in this weird sort of Japanese-style hotel cubicle full of fruit wrapped in cling film. I didn't um, get any fruit. No, well, well, and a sort of a shower for some reason, and no windows, but a, lot, a few newspapers. After about an hour of agonizing, Paul Merton comes and says, how are you doing? And then you're taken down to the studio where they take you, they actually have a rehearsal of the whole thing. And to your mounting horror and dismay, you are shown all the things that you assume those brilliant wits are uh, only seeing for the first time. 
and the scales fall from your eyes. It's a terrible thing to deprive people of the joy of believing that Have I Got News For You is, as you see it, a half hour of utterly brilliant lightning repartee. Tightly edited. They record about an hour and a quarter, then edit out more than half, leaving the half hour that's broadcast on Friday evening. Few guests have gone public. I took my £800 and shut up. Boris Johnson got a thousand pounds but didn't shut up. In his case and mine, Ian Hislop captained the opposing team. How much of your audience do you think understands the way a programme like this is made? I think a lot of them don't understand and I don't think most of them care. What they want to see is a programme that's funny, with people being funny and um, being controversial with each other. They like a sort of combative element. Aspiring is, uh, I agree, because I've been on the programme completely yes. spontaneous, but I'm really asking about the part that isn't. The captions, the odd one out, yes. all that. Those are always, I think, the least amusing bit. I mean, I think, A, most people know anyway, because at least four newspapers have said, we reveal the secret secret, which they were told at a press conference when <laughs> the question was asked, do you know the questions in advance? And the answer comes back, yes. So it's not, not terribly secret. Yes, but Ian, yeah, you, you enjoyed... Um, stripping bare the artifices of uh, politics and, Indeed. And, and the media. What kind of an answer is it when being accused of rigging something to be told, well, um, everybody knows we rig it, it's been in all the newspapers already? No, all I'm saying is it, it's never been denied. If, if people say, how is the programme put together, they have been told from day one, that is how the programme's put together. So, I mean, saying, is it rigged? Um, do you know the answers in advance? We've always said yes. <laughs> day in anyone's life. Wonderful to have it captured just as it happened by a professional television crew. We hadn't quite realised what was involved, that it was more that really virtually everything was staged and done over and over again. That's Lynn Parry Wood. Her father Bob married Audrey towards the end of last year for both their second marriage and they made a wonderful couple for an episode of Granada Television's The Big Day. But Lynn says far from following the bride and groom as they planned and carried out their wedding, the television crew directed them. And far from it being, as it pretended, a diary of months of preparation, everything was filmed in the final week or so before the marriage. They filmed him having his hair cut while he had it cut the week before, so the barber was just pretending to snip his hair. The buying of the wedding ring, that was done before that was returned to the shop, he, and he was filmed going in to pick it up. There's a waistcoat. Dad was pretending to try it on and also saying that Audrey hadn't seen it to balance out the fact that my dad hadn't actually seen the wedding dress, so they sort of invented that little skit. She Once had seen it. She had seen it. Well, she suggested he buy it in the first place. She pointed <laughs> the shop out and everything. She says Granada tried unsuccessfully to make the couple argue about their wedding plans. They wanted Lynn's dad to be filmed practising his speech and admitting to an attack of nerves, so he did his best to oblige. For each scene, subjects were given general instructions about what was wanted, and then conversation was ad-libbed. As I watched the film with Lynn, she explained how she tried to capture some of this on her own camcorder. But it's quite funny, because the film crew themselves do not like being filmed. No. And if you try and get close to them, they turn their back or they stop talking, or they, they looked highly embarrassed. They just did not want to be filmed at all. This is totally staged. That's my, my father's brother, who's yes. going to be best man and they're pretending to write a song for Audrey. And again, people were often saying, well, how did you like the song? Well, there wasn't any song. It was just something they set up just to introduce my, uh, my uncle into the picture. They never did write a song for no. her? No. No, they never wrote a song. The end result was exactly how they are. Um, it was a good representation, um, but in all other respects, it was fiction. Um, and what is worrying, really, is that other people don't realise it's fiction. Because people would come up to my father after, afterwards and say things like, well, did Audrey like the waistcoat? Or what happened about this? Or what happened about that? And my father's quite amused. He said, well, it wasn't really happening. You know, it was, it was just made up. And people really generally do not believe that it's made up. Granada Television refused me permission to use any clips from the programme. They declined to be interviewed, but said in a statement, the Big Day was a light-hearted series, not a hard-hitting current affairs programme. Asking someone to recreate a scene is exactly that, recreating something that actually happened. Granada Television therefore refutes that anybody was acting for the camera, as the word acting implies that a person is not being his or herself. This tortured sophistry, which would turn the Beatles film Help into a documentary, wriggles on the pinpoint of what I'm trying to indicate. Not that the things documentaries allegedly record mightn't have happened, not that they didn't happen at a different time. No, it's a smaller but creepier lie I'm trying to expose. 
Whether or not they happened, you, the viewer, haven't, as you believe, witnessed an actual event. If the sort of thing that you've just described is done, I don't find that acceptable. Jeremy Mills is one of Britain's most successful TV producers. Now a director at industry leader Lion Television, he's one of the men behind such favourites as Airport and Hotel. He's the executive producer of BBC One's new docu-soap, Paddington Green, which starts tomorrow night. I have a rule for our sort of programmes that we make, that if you're trying to tell a story about somebody's life and something that's happening in it, and you miss a crucial moment, the skill then is to find another way of telling it. Classic thing, somebody gets a phone call saying uh, they're about to be sacked or they've been sacked. You miss that phone call. You either just have to get them to tell you about that, or you get them to tell somebody else who doesn't know about it to get their reaction out. The one thing you can't do is reenact the phone call because that, A, it doesn't feel right, and B, it would be dishonest. Night and day, you are the one. Only you need the moon or under the sun. Soho Stories went out on BBC Two about two years ago. Jeremy Mills was its executive producer and therefore ultimately responsible for the series. We were introduced to a range of colourful characters from this square mile of London. Among them a hardened drinker, a prostitute and a drag queen. It was filmed by the talented cameraman and director Chris Tyrrell. Soho Stories kicked off with a dramatic 24 hours in Soho on the day the area was brought to a standstill by an IRA bomb scare. This is Great London Radio from the BBC on 94.9 FM and uh, news is just coming in that the West End is being close to all traffic. Initial reports suggest a bomb alert around the Soho area but we're waiting for... I'm sure Chris probably thought his, uh, his ship had come in because uh, he was obviously filming around the area that day and he didn't know a bomb scare was going to happen of course so he got this marvellous footage of, of Soho deserted I believe the Haymarket is shut Regent oh, Street South is shut Piccadilly Circus is shut Phil Murphy is the dresser at the Palace Theatre where Les Miserables is showing TV viewers see him trapped inside the theatre ironing shirts and waiting to hear if the matinee that day is cancelled here's what he said to the camera at the moment Soho is just completely cut off for the rest of the world. I mean, you can't get in or out. People can't get into the area. Then obviously the show can't happen. I mean, half the cast are still outside the uh, exclusion zone, as it were. Now, note that term, at the moment. That's what he said. Perceptive viewers among you might have wondered how a single cameraman could have managed to pop up on both sides of the safety cordon at the same time. During that scene, uh, we, we came to you inside the theatre, inside the exclusion zone. So he must have been there too. Well, you'd think that, but in fact, um, that was about four months later they filmed me in the theatre. Did he give you a script of any kind? <laughs> it wasn't so much a script, it was more like a suggestion of what I should say and to recreate the fact it was supposed to be on the day of the bomb scare. Did it happen exactly like that? It happened in a way, it was more... It would have been better television had they been there on the day because everybody in the theatre had to go down to the stalled bar, which is below ground level at the front of the theatre, and we basically stayed there till for about four or five hours. So I was in the building. However, I wasn't ironing that day at all. But that rather sort of poignant shot of me sitting in the stalls, totally alone, surrounded by red velvet, empty seats, reading the paper, was totally fake. And our stage manager making the announcement on the tannoy to keep away from the windows and we're going to cancel the matinee was totally fake. Staff are advised that Soho is still cut off due to the current bomb scare. You're also advised not to stand next to any windows for your own safety. Was any attempt made to explain to viewers that uh, much of this was reconstructed? No, not at all. No. Now I'm confused. The executive producer of that programme was Jeremy Mills, who told us his golden rule was that you don't ask your characters to reenact scenes. Yet Phil, and he says another character, were asked to pretend they were in the middle of a bomb scare four months after the event. And certain scenes, like the tannoy announcement, were, it seems, restaged. To try to clear this up, I phoned Jeremy Mills to ask him to explain this apparent contradiction. Nobody was asked to reenact anything, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and I, I think the thing you're talking about is two sh very short interview clips that Chris just did after the event. Well, you had Phil, as I understand it, standing at the ironing board, ironing shirts, and talking as though there were a bomb scare in progress. But, but he says that was recorded four months after the event. Uh, it may well have been. 
But then they, it was a reconstruction. Why was it a reconstruction? It was an interview that was recorded later. It's a very common, uh, very, very common thing in all documentaries. No, but Jeremy, I, I've, I've seen the, the series. It didn't look as if he was giving an interview after the event. It looked as if he was talking to the viewers from the event. At the moment, Soho is just completely cut off for the rest of the world. I mean, you can't get in or out. Why don't you just admit that it was a reconstruction? There wasn't a reconstruction. What do you mean by reconstruction? I, I, as far as I'm concerned, when you get people to, to uh, get together and reenact scenes that have happened, they interact with other people, uh, because you haven't got it, that's, that's one thing. When you go back and talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis and interview, clearly that's something different. Jeremy Mills there. Words just fail me. Unusual? Well, take another programme we've investigated. A Channel 4 documentary about two 17-year-old rent boys in Glasgow, broadcast in September 1997. Chickens. Too much, too young. It told the moving story of David and Cammy and their life on the streets of Glasgow. It was peppered with dramatic footage of the two negotiating with clients from their office, a public toilet, and on their office phone, a public call box. Phone's hanging. Phone answer. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. A serious and powerful peek into the lives of two rent boys, it received good reviews at the time. It would hardly have worked without these scenes involving the punters. They look so real. But now the programme's researcher has spoken out for the first time. Peter McGraith has told me how this supposed reality was captured. Basically, I made a call from a mobile phone to the phone box where the boys hang around beside a public toilet. You could hear... Uh, at the indistinct voice uh, yes. of someone who was supposed to be a punter making the call uh, on, on the programme. You're saying that that was you, but, but that this was not revealed. Yeah, that was me, yeah. And uh, also later in the documentary, my voice is heard coming from a car as I'm, I'm picking them up outside the same toilet. I think the car belonged to someone on the production team. And who was driving it? Uh, someone from the production team. And, and whose voice it was it that we heard from the car? And my boy, voice from uh, the back seat. The reason they reconstructed these scenes, he says, was that to have tried to capture real pickups would have put the boy's clients at risk. Fair enough. But Peter McGrath says he didn't realise it was the producer's intention to have these scenes masquerade as real. This he only learnt once the film was almost ready for broadcast. We were in the editing suite and the producer had invited a friend along who also works in the media to see the finished or a rough cut of the documentary. He was really impressed and moved and shocked by some of it and he started to talk about the scenes with the punters which he was most surprised by and I said oh obviously they were set up, that was myself and a friend who was standing in for the, the punters and I don't know quite how much I'd got out of my mouth by the time the producer <laughs> shut me up. I mean, she really went pretty crazy. Most of your concern would be met if, either at the beginning or at the end of the programme, someone had said, or the caption had appeared, which alerted viewers to the fact that these scenes were reconstructions. Yes, but there's a problem with that. To say that scenes had been set up would have given the impression that this was fake. This was much more real than your average television programme, I would say. Uh, these boys were talking very much from the heart. I don't know how and when is best to indicate that there are set-up scenes. But look, there's a problem here. TV producers claim, on the one hand, that everyone knows these things have to be reconstructed, and, on the other, that viewers would feel let down if they found out. How can both be true? Shouldn't we make up our own mind? The TV regulators seem to think so. The Independent Television Commission's Code of Practice says whenever a reconstruction is used in a documentary, current affairs or news programme, it should be labelled so that the viewer is not misled. I'm standing outside the new glass-fronted offices of Channel 4 in London's Horsbury Road. We've told them what we've discovered about their chickens documentary, and I'm going in to find out the response of Stuart Cosgrove, whose department commissioned the programme. Thank you. How are you? Great. My apologies for uh, keeping oh, me. I was actually yeah. in another meeting. Good to see you. Can I put it to you that the three scenes in this documentary were plainly reconstructed? and that uh, there was no advice to the viewers that the scenes were reconstructed. Yeah, I mean, I think that the 
first thing that I would say to that, Matthew, is that there's a, a really important distinction, I think, to be made between reconstruction and construction. What the uh, programme makers had, had elected to do was to um, uh, demonstrate things that actually did happen in, re uh, in real life, mm. but they were doing them on a date or a day different from their actual reality uh, in terms of this filming events. I mean, curiously enough, uh, not unlike um, exactly what we're doing just now, uh, my days for being at Channel 4's headquarters in London are usually Thursday and Friday, although I've come down on a Tuesday to do this interview, so we're in exactly the same position of, as it were, constructing uh, reality of the going-ons of people's lives. Well, not entirely. Um, we haven't done this interview before. Um, it's happening now, and this is the only time that it's happening, and it's real. But the scenes reconstructed for the chickens program uh, were not actually happening. But the viewers thought they saw the boys doing these things. And in fact, the viewers didn't. Do you accept that the ITC code of conduct on reconstruction was breached in this case? Uh, no, I don't accept that at all because I actually don't... Um, uh, I don't accept the terms of what you're saying in terms of reconstruction. What this was, was uh, certainly a modification and a construction of events that do actually happen. Clearly there might have been other ways that we could have communicated to the audience the exact nature of how the filming took place, but it certainly wasn't a reconstruction, as you would put reconstruction with a flashing light on the screen. It wasn't that, and therefore it wasn't a breach of the code. Well, I don't know any other definition of the term reconstruction. The, the term reconstruction doesn't mean that it intended to deceive. It sim simply means that a scene was reconstructed. No, I think this, the point I'm making is that the, the scene was actually more of a construction than a reconstruction. Hmm. Stuart Cosgrove at Channel 4. Construction is not a word that appears in the ITC's rulebook. Reconstruction, construction, retrospective interview. Where does this all leave us? Now, nobody seriously thinks that asking a politician to walk up a flight of stairs for the camera needs to be labelled reconstruction. Some people would think that asking a bridegroom to buy a wedding ring a second time ought to be labelled reconstruction. Most people would think that staging a nocturnal bedroom revision of the highway code should be labelled reconstruction. I think pretending to be in a bomb alert was a reconstruction. Do you think that asking quiz contestants to pretend they're hearing questions for the first time is a reconstruction? You may think that faking a curb-crawling incident with one of your production crew's own cars was a reconstruction, rather than a construction. No, I don't argue that we can easily distinguish the acceptable from the unacceptable. I argue that making good, attention-grabbing, gripping television pushes the producers, all producers, into artifice. It is only a paper moon Hanging over a cardboard sea But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believe in me Next week in Paris on TV, I'll be finding out how TV justifies using pictures or sounds from one time or place to illustrate another. Clamper Ray Brown tells me how he acted up for the cameras. And I meet a programme maker who admits he tries to fool the public. Sir David Attenborough on Life in Zoos. So join me, Matthew Paris, next Sunday at 12 noon, here on 5 Live.